how it was in that place, how light hung in a bright pool of air like water in an eddy of cloud and sky, I will long remember. I will long recall the maple's blooming wings, the oaks proud with rue, the spiders deep in silk, the squirrels fat on mast, the fields and draws and coves where quail and peewees call. Earth loved more than any earth. Stand firm, hold fast. Trees burdened with leaf and bird, root deep, grow tall. I have never, as I recall, at any time when people ask my profession, or I need to write down my profession on some sort of an application, I never called myself a writer uh, or a teacher, although I spent many years in the classroom. When I need to do that, I usually say farmer. That doesn't exactly fit. No, I don't, uh, hey, I write, but I don't think of myself as well. I'm interested in a great many things. And the other things I do inform my writing. I write about uh, the things I know, the things that are familiar to me. I've been called an Appalachian writer. I have never uh, had in mind writing an Appalachian story. They just happen to be placed here where I live and where I know people, and they happen to come to mind and are suggested to me. And if they happen to belong here, to belong to these people, that just, uh, I think, is uh, fairly logical. I'm not uh, interested in becoming a uh, regional writer, particularly. Uh, I wouldn't mind being called a southern writer. I don't like the idea of Appalachian writers being set apart from all the others, as if they didn't quite belong. It's a far piece, Lark said. I'm afraid we won't make it afore dusty dark. We squatted down in the road and rested on the edge of a clay rut. Lark set his poke on the crust of a nags track and I lifted the saddlebags off my shoulder. The leather was damp underneath. We ought ne'er thought to be scholars, Lark said. The sunball had turned over the hill above Riddle Hargan's and it was hot in the valley. Grackles walked the top rail of the fence, breathing with open beaks. They halted and looked at us, the legs wide apart and rusty backs arched. I knowed you'd get dolesome every reached troublesome creek, I said. I knowed it was a coming. Lark drew his thin legs together and rested his chin on his knees. If and I was growed up to twelve like you, he said, I'd go along pert. I'd not mind my hand. Writing ain't done with your left hand, I said. It won't be again you learning. I oughtn't to tried busting that dynamite cap, Larkson. It's a hurting sight to see my left hand with two fingers gone. Before long, it seemed Plum natural, I said. In a little spell, they'll never give a thought to it. The grackles called harshly from the rail fence. We'd bet the apples while we're sitting, I said. Lark opened the pole holding a Wilburn and a Henry back. You take the Wilburn, I told him, for it was the largest. I choose the Henry back because it pops when I ride it. I 
I was born in uh, Chambers County, Alabama, uh, in 1906. And I grew up in a home, uh, 10 children, five girls, five boys, and I was the oldest boy. And in the midst of a great uh, many relatives who had farms in the area. And all my grandparents were alive, my uncles, aunts, dozens of cousins. And I think I had a very uh, pleasing childhood looking back on it. Uh, we worked in the fields and walked to school some distance. And uh, I look back on those days as almost uh, the happiest time of my life. You know, Creason asked me, he asked me how I learned to cook. And I told him I got hungry. James Still is a man who, who came um, out of North Alabama as a young man to attend college in um, Lincoln Memorial University at Harrogate, Tennessee, close to the Cumberland Gap. From there, he attended um, Vanderbilt University. He is a uh, contemporary of the fugitive agrarians who uh, flourished at Vanderbilt in the 20s and 30s. However, he did not associate himself with uh, the fugitive agrarian group. He remained his own person, and um, uh, after a year of graduate work in uh, Illinois, at the University of Illinois, he <clears throat> came into East Kentucky to the Heinemann Settlement School in the um, 1930s, height of the Great Depression, and he has remained there um, ever since. He's lived in East Kentucky for over half a century now still belongs to a, that, that literary quickening that um, took place in the South, generally, in the late 20s and in the 30s. He carries uh, on a tradition that you find established in Frost and in Edgar Lee Masters, the author of the Spoon River Anthology, he knows how to take folk life and folk speech, people in rural areas, in small towns, and using, using their language and using their folk ways, elevate it to uh, a literary quality. I believe I would have been writing no matter where I happened uh, to live. I came very near being born in Texas. I think I would have been writing about Texas if I lived there. Uh, in fact, Marjorie Kennedy Wallace, the uh, Florida author, once said uh, that no matter where I had lived uh, or happened to be living, I would have been writing about uh, that particular area. I would have written anyway, no matter. It is not necessarily this place that causes me to write. And what interested me most here, in the beginning, and what held me here, I must confess, was not the people. It was these hills, it was the trees. I'm, I'm a passionate uh, naturalist and uh, I was fascinated by these wild mountains and all the plants and, and animals in them and then I came to know the people I was born humble at the foot of mountains my face was set on the immensity of earth and sown and upon oaks full-bodied and old. There is so much writ upon the parchment of leaves, so much of beauty blown upon the winds, I can but fold my hands and sink my knees in the leaf pages. Under the mute trees I have cried with this scattering of knowledge. Beneath the flight of birds shaken 
with this waste of wings. I was born humble. My heart grieves beneath this wealth of wisdom perished with the leaves. Clark wrapped the damp seeds in a bit of paper torn from the poke. I got up raising the saddlebag. The grackles flew lazily off the rails, settling to a lynn beside the road, their dark wings brushing the leaves like shadows. It's now to six miles to the forks, I said. Lark asked to carry the saddlebags away so I might rest. I told him this load would break your bones down. I let him carry my brogans, though. He tied the strings into a bow and hung them about his neck. We walked on, stepping among hardened clumps of mud and wheel-brightened rocks. Cowbells clanked in a redbud thicket on the hills. A calf bellowed. A bird hissed in a persimmon tree. I couldn't see it, but Lark glanced its flicking tail feathers. A cherry bird's night tame as a pet crow, Lark said. Once I found one setting her some eggs, she never flew away. She was that trusting. Lark was tiring now. He stumped his sore big toe twice, crying a mite. You'll have to stop dragging your feet or put on shoes, I said. My feet would get raw as a beef if and I wore shoes all the way till dark, Lark complained. My brogans is full of pinchers. If and I me a drop of water on my toe, it would feel a sight better. Farther on, we found a spring drip. Lark held his foot under the cool stream. He wanted to scramble up the bank to find where the water seeped from the ground. There might be a spring lizard sticking its head out of the mud, he said. I wouldn't give in to it. So we went on. The sunball in our faces, road curving beyond sight. I've heard tell they do choir things, a fork school lark said. Yet I forgot what it was they'd done. They've got a big bell hung square up on some poles, I said, and they ring it for they get up a mornings and when they eat. They got a little sheep bell to ring in the schoolhouse before and makes books. D. Finley took a month's schooling there and he told me a passel. D. says it's a sight on earth, the washing and scrubbing and sweeping they do. Says they might not take a hide off of floors or washing them too much. I bet it's the truth, Lark said. I've heard Mommy it's not healthy keeping dust brushed in the air and a damp in floors every day, I said. And Dee says they got a passel of cows in a barn. They tame wet a broom and scrub every cow before they milk. Dee reckons they'll soon be brushing them cows' teeth. I bet it's the truth, Lark said. All that messing around don't hurt them cows none. They get so much milk, everybody has a god's plenty. The sun ball dropped behind the beech woods on the ridge. It grew cooler. We rested again in a horse patch, Lark spitting on his big toe, easing the pain. Lark said, I ought ne'er thought to be a scholar. They never was a pure scholar amongst all our folks, I recalled. Never a one went all the way through the books and come out yon side. I've got a notion doing it. He'd take a right smart spell, Lark said. A story for me uh, in the beginning, it occurs to me, it seems to me in a flash, that is, somehow I have the ending certainly before I had the beginning. The one I had, uh, I knew of a, of a child, a stepchild of a, a student of mine who spent, was lost on the mountain for two, uh, two days and nights. 
and below freezing temperature. Now, I never saw this child, but I just keep thinking about it. And I, it, it kept, it watched my mind, I kept thinking about it. There's no story there. It's just, an, uh, you hear, read these things in newspapers. Uh, it just kept bothering me. And first thing you know, I'm a, I, I see the stepmother, uh, the grandfather, the situation. It came a little uh, project of mine. Here is a story, very simple and if possible in words of one syllable. It isn't possible, but anyway. No repetitions. One character. Uh, spending, a, in the case of the story, one uh, sub-zero night on the mountain and how she coped uh, with this situation. She was only six years old. That kept bothering me. It kept building my mind, kept on. And finally one day I wrote this story. I got very emotionally involved in it. And toward the end, I simply had to stop. And it was about three weeks before I went back and completed the story. Once uh, in a little reading session, a lady told me that she regretted that I had written that story because she hadn't been able to forget it. And I said, that's the reason I wrote it, so I could forget it. I gave it another thought once I got it down. James still is a minimalist. He always seeks, whether in poems or short stories or in the novel, the minimum means for effective expression. Nothing is extraneous. Everything is turned down. He told me once that, um, that his editor at Viking complained of this and said, you want to take out all the words. He does. He, he will strip a scene to its essentials. He will strip a quatrain or a line to its very essentials. The result is that you have a kind of classic purity and simplicity. I was born in a rich pocket. I never seen the sun ball without an heist in my chin. My eyes were sought up on the hills from the beginning. Till I come on the word in this good book, I used to think a mountain was the standingest object in the sight of God. It says here, they go skipping and hopping like sheep, a rising and a falling. These hills are just dirt waves washing through eternity. My brother, there ain't a valley so, but what he'll rise again. There ain't a hill standing so proud, but it'll sink to the low ground of sorrow. Oh, my children, where'er we going on this mighty river of earth? A borning, begetting, and a dying. The living and the dead, riding the waters. Where'er it's sweeping us. I think the, if I had to select one theme, uh, basic to the lives of the people here, I think it is the will to survive any difficulty any sorrow, any condition. I have seen them do it, and I have seen them do it now. And I admire that. 
I admire people who are not afraid to be themselves. Is there nobody playing roles here? Uh, when a man makes a statement, that's it, as far as he's concerned, and I know it. It not, may not be acceptable to me, or maybe not to us, but that's, that's his view. And he doesn't mind making it, except for those guarded subjects, which he never uh, mentions or brings up. I assure you, uh, these statements, conversations that are in my notebooks no uh, taped uh, interview would have ever captured them. Things said unawares. We were ready to go on when the sound of hooves came up the valley. They were far off and dull. We waited, resting this bit longer. A bright-faced neck rounded the creek curve, lifting hooves carefully along the wheel tracks. Kane Griggs was in the saddle, riding with his feet out of the stirrups, for his legs were too long to fit. He halted beside us, looking down where we sat. We stood up, shifting our feet. I reckon your pappy's sending his young'uns down to the fork school, Kane guess. Going down to stay a while and get a mess of fool notions. Pappy never sent us, I said. We made our own minds. Kane lifted his hat and scratched his head. I never put much store by all them fucked on teachings. A learning queer on natural things, not a grain of good on the Lord's creation. Ain't nothing wrong with learning to cipher and read writing, I said. None I ever heard tell of. I've heard they teach the earth is round, Kane said, and that goes against scripture. The book says plime blank, it's got four corners. Whoever see the ball have a corner. Kane patted his nagging scowl, his voice rose. They's a powerful mess of fancy foolishness they teach a chap these days. A pouring in till they got no more judgment than a granny hatchet. A grinding their brains away with book reading. I always said a little learning's a good thing, sharpening the mind like a saw blade. But too much knocks the edge off the points and darkens a fellow's reckoning. Lark's mouth opened. He shook his head, agreeing. Hain, everybody knows what to swallow and what to spit out, Kane warned. Now, if I was you... Young and tender-minded, I'd play hardhead down the forks and let nothing but truth get through my skull. It takes a heap of knocking to get a thing proper anyhow, and the harder it speed in, the longer it's liable to stay. I figure the Lord put our brains in a bone box to sort of keep the devilment strained out. Cain plucked his nag. She started off, lifting her long chin as the bits tightened in her mouth. Cain called back to us, but his words were lost of the rattle of hooves. I bet what that feller says is the plime blank gospel, Lark said, looking after the disappearing nag. I'm scared I can't tell what truth and what ain't. If an I was growed up to twelve like you, I'd know. I'm afeard I'll swallow a lie tale. Cain Griggs don't know square to the end of everything, I said. We went on. The sun ball red, mellowing the sky. Lark trudged beside me, holding to a strap of the sag, barely lifting his feet above the ruts. His teeth were set against his lower lip, his eyes downcast. I knowed you'd get dosome, I said. Martins flew the valley after the sun was gone, fluttering sharp wings, slicing the air. A whippoorwill called. Shadows thickened in the laurel patches. We came upon the forks 
in the early evening and looked down upon the school from the ridge. Lights were bright in the windows, though shapes of houses were lost against the hills. We rested, listened. No sound came out of all the strange place where the lights were unblinking and cold. I stood up, lifting the saddlebag once more. Lark arose too, hesitating, dreading the last steps. I ought ne'er thought to be a scholar, Lark said. His voice was small and tight, and the words trembled on his tongue. He caught hold of my hand and I felt the blunt edge of his palm where the fingers were gone. We started down the ridge, picking our way through stony dark. And he jumped out of the oven, and he grabbed the sack of gold and took off like Snyder's hound. James Steele, we remembered as, a, uh, as an expert craftsman. Nobody um, this will have different meanings now for different people, for people who are wishing to learn how to write, and wishing to discover what is the absolute minimum that one needs, say, for a short story or for a novel. And they'll go to still for that. But for people who are not interested in being writers themselves, but who wish to know how it was with those people in that place at that particular time, how did they speak? What were the circumstances of their lives? What were the things they were concerned with? They'll go to Still's work for that. It is a, uh, a body of work that will weather well. I shall leave these prisoning hills, though they topple their barren heads to level earth and the forest slide uprooted out of the sky. Though the waters of troublesome, of trace fork, of sand lake rise in the single body to glean the valleys, to drown lush penny royal, to unravel rail fences. Though the sunball breaks the ridges into dust and burns its strength into the blistered rock, I cannot leave, I cannot go away. Being all these hills, being one with a fox stealing into the shadows, one with a newborn foal, the lumbering ox drawing green beech logs to mill, one with the dead feet of man climbing and descending, and one with death rising to bloom again. I cannot go. Being all these hills, I cannot pass beyond. 